right, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for coming to the LPI virtual seminar this week. It's uh, slightly earlier than usual. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, our guest this week is Dr. Uh, Mark Fox Powell of the Open University. who will be talking about uh, ocean surface exchange on the icy ocean world. Uh, uh, Dr. Fox Powell is a research fellow at the Open University in the UK, uh, and completed a PhD in astrobio at the University of Ed Ed Edinburgh in 2016, uh, followed by a postdoc at University of St. Andrews. Uh, his research focuses on the icy ocean worlds, such as Europa and Enceladus, which may be habitable today. Uh, just a, a few reminder about the uh, talk, uh, please, uh, during the talk, leave your microphone muted and your camera off. Um, if you have any questions that you'd like to uh, uh, ask, uh, please be, feel free to put them into the chat and we'll read them off in the, la in the last 15 minutes or so of the talk. Uh, with that, thank you so much, uh, Mark, please take it away. Okay, great, thanks, Sean. Um, my pleasure to be here. I'm just gonna start a timer, so hopefully keep track of where we are and, and time and everything. And just to say, I'm here in the UK and, and the sun is setting, so if, if I just fade into darkness here, that's just just the way it is. I've got a couple of lamps, so hopefully that won't happen. But um, yeah, so I'll be talking to you about some research that I have been leading and also involved with over the last few years. Um, really trying to understand the, the relationship between uh, the oceans and the surfaces of, of these icy ocean worlds um, that Sean was mentioning. So um, really kind of trying to understand some of the ice shell processes, some of the chemical processes that are going on and the provenance of um, materials that we see at the surfaces of these worlds. And, and really kind of my driving motivation to do this is, is because we aren't likely to access the oceans of these worlds anytime soon. So studying the surface is really one of our best kind of windows into, into the subsurface. So pinning down and understanding what's going on within the ice shell um, is kind of fundamental to that effort. So there's quite a lot of people that will have been involved in some you know, in, in ways in this research and um, I'll kind of go try and credit them as best I can as, as we go through. Uh, let's move the slides on. So just quickly, just to give you a brief um, summary about where I'm coming from. So um, really kind of, as I mentioned, trying to understand, trying to develop a kind of a mechanistic understanding of, of ice shell processes so that we can um, study the oceans of these, of these uh, ocean worlds indirectly by, by observing surface features. So um, I, I kind of have a varied background. My first degree was actually in, in marine microbiology and I've, I've drifted into planetary geochemistry um, gradually since, and, and kind of that's now my main focus, but I, I draw on my my background um, using this kind of three-pronged approach where, where I conduct lab experiments, I do a bit of, of geochemical modeling and, and also kind of um, look at kind of messy natural systems as well to try and understand, uh, to try and kind of ground truth some of, the, some of what we see in the experiments and the modeling. My main focus here is the, are the ice brine and salt dynamics at the ocean worlds, uh, processes that might connect the ocean to the surface. And what I want to do with, with my work and, and as we kind of move into the future and I think what we will need in order to support um, both ongoing ground-based telescope observations and you know next generation of, of missions to um, to the to particularly the Jupiter system we have a couple of missions coming up this decade uh, we, we, should, we should need to develop an understanding of, of these ice shells um, that mirrors our kind of um, uh, geological understanding of the earth and how the earth's surface interacts with the deep subsurface so this is what I want to, want to kind of be a part of here and, and try and get across is how we, how we bring in the ethos and the approaches of, of the geosciences, which have been so successful in understanding the earth system and apply that to these kind of lower temperature regimes of ice and, and ice hosted materials. So what I'm hoping to do is, is sort of uh, present two, um, two parts of this talk so that, that I'll, I'll start by uh, describing and outlining some experiments um, conducted looking into some of the really kind of energetic eruptive cryovolcanism um, or, or eruptive plume um, processes going on at Saturn's moon Enceladus. Um, and then uh, in the second part of the talk, um, I'll probably spend more time in this first part, so we'll see how much time we have left at the end. But in the second part, I want to move on and describe a bit of the kind of field work that I've been doing and some of the insights that we can get from that. Um, and that's focused on, on Jupiter's moon Europa. So 
I know some of you may have seen me talk recently, uh, so apologies to those who, who might be seeing duplicate material from other talks, um, but hopefully there'll be something new, at least for everyone in here. So, first of all, talking about Saturn's moon Enceladus. Now, I don't want to assume um, uh, knowledge, uh, a, 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 a consistent level of knowledge across everyone in the audience here. I'm not exactly sure uh, where everyone's knowledge is, so I'll just give a very brief introduction to Enceladus. It's the sixth largest moon of Saturn, uh, has, a, has a predominantly water ice surface, and the Cassini spacecraft, when it arrived at the Saturn system in the early 2000s, uh, found that Enceladus um, has these really, really energetic, large scale, um, hundreds of kilometers uh, sized plumes emanating from the south polar region. So these plumes actually feed the, um, the, the formation of Saturn's largest, most diffuse ring, the E ring, the, as you can see backlit in this amazing image from Cassini um, it, on the right hand side. Um, and Cassini was actually able to really serendipitously, it, it was carrying a, a couple of mass spectrometers designed to study dust in the Saturn system. And it was able to use these, these instruments to study ice grains that had, had actually originated from Enceladus. And thanks to Cassini, we now know that Enceladus, um, underneath its icy surface, has a global subsurface ocean that's in contact with a silicate rocky core. Um, it's experience, there's experiencing ongoing hydrothermal water rock interaction. Um, and you know, that, that really raises a lot of um, really exciting uh, possibilities about the prospects for biological activity. Uh, we have the potential for uh, redox gradients being supplied into the ocean that could be exploited by microbial life. So Enceladus may be, you know, one of our best opportunities to, to uh, study a, a currently habitable environment that's in our solar system beyond, beyond Earth. So as I mentioned, Cassini uh, encountered a range of um, ice grains in, in the E-ring and in the plumes of Enceladus that uh, have emanated from that ocean. Um, and there's kind of three main populations of ice grains that were found. So the first um, type one here on this list were effectively pure water ice. Uh, and the second type included um, some macromolecular, uh, quite complex organic molecules. And then the third type were actually salt rich. So these had um, water ice alongside uh, sodium and potassium chloride and carbonate salts. So while the first two uh, classes of, of um, ice particles here can um, and probably do form through vapor condensation, at least in part. This third type um, really requires, it, it, it's, it's really impossible to obtain these levels of, of salt from vapor condensate. So th this really is, must come from the, the, the freezing of, of ocean water, of, of liquid. So analysis of these grains alongside some of the plume gases now has taught us that we are looking at an alkaline ocean, um, probably dominated by sodium and chloride and carbonate with a pH of probably around nine, possibly as high as 11. Um, and um, you know, these, it's hard to overstate really how important, uh, in my mind at least, these, these ice grains are. I mean, these are effectively frozen samples of a subsurface ocean uh, that we know that we have good reason to think at least is, is habitable to, to um, microbial life now in the present day. Uh, so these, these are quite important objects to understand from the point of view of astrobiology. And I think they have a lot to tell us as well about um, uh, uh, this process occurring at Enceladus, uh, the process of, of plume formation, which we now have seen, um, we have good reason to believe it may be operating at um, Europa and also at Ceres and potentially elsewhere as well. So um, these are important objects to understand as they'll give us an insight into uh, this, this process of plume formation. Now, given that importance, um, there's actually very little known about how the mechanisms by which these, um, these solid grains form. So we think that um, effectively we have uh, ejection of droplets into, into cracks within the ice and that they freeze extremely rapidly as they transit up through the ice cracks into space. But actually the process is going on within these droplets and their formation histories are not very well understood. So that is really what we set out to do um, uh, and address experimentally. So we can turn to a little bit of, of theory about, about what actually happens to a salty liquid aqueous fluid as it freezes. 
um, very similar to a kind of silicate melt when you when it cools uh, you have um, crystallization of various phases so initially we might have ice forming which um, is well known well documented from sea ice and other ices on earth will exclude the rest of that brine into these kind of brine channels these brine veins between ice grains and as you continue cooling um, you will encounter the saturation points of various minerals which will precipitate and accumulate and, until you have a solidified system. Now the sequence and the composition, the sequence of precipitation here and the composition of your resulting solid phases um, is relatively straightforward to predict um, under equilibrium conditions. If all components are remaining in equilibrium with each other at, at all stages of freezing, um, with some thermodynamic data we, we can actually predict this um, using, using geochemical models. But of course, this kind of really rapid freezing that is believed to be occurring at Enceladus, um, well, when you, when you increase the cooling rate in these systems, now kinetics of mineral precipitation um, and uh, uh, nucleation become important. And this is really not very well understood at this point and um, really needs to be addressed via experiment. And there is good indications, there's a kind of growing now list of, of experimental papers that um, are showing how really rapid cooling of brines like this, freezing of brines, um, can induce, uh, can, can in, uh, form mineral assemblages that depart uh, quite significantly from this equilibrium predictions. Uh, so clearly something, it's clearly a, there's mechanisms here that need to be understood. And actually as you increase cooling rate, um, even more, we can we can depart from crystalline phases entirely. So th this plot is for a, a, um, a evaporative cooling experiment here, just using pure water ice and showing how as cooling rate increases, which is actually in the, um, the left hand direction on the x axis, crystallinity rapidly decreases. So we can actually form amorphous phases of ice if we if we have rapid enough cooling rates. So, um, as I mentioned, we, we set out to, to address this experimentally and understand whether, um, uh, understand the formation of solid phases within the Enceladus plumes during freezing. And to do this, we started by designing a, a ocean simulant, a fluid that simulates the ocean chemistry of Enceladus. Now, this is just drawn from a range of kind of recent literature. Most, it's all kind of observations of the plumes, including the plume particles and, and plume gases. Um, I can talk a little bit more about the, the assumptions we made if you want at the end. Uh, we've synthesized this effectively at two pH levels, pH 9 and, and pH 11. And the first step really was to, was to get a baseline equilibrium prediction for what this fluid should do when it freezes. So this is what you're seeing here. This is, these are geochemical models run, thermodynamic models, I should say, run using the program FreezeChem, um, written by Charles Marion et al. And, um, what you're seeing on these plots, you have uh, these two main plots here. You have minerals that form at both pH and 11 and pH 9, and you have the temperature on the x-axis and, and just the, the abundance of solids in grams on the y. And you can see as, as you cool, you, you form these, these various phases. Now, I, don't, I won't talk you through everything that's going on in these predictions here. Um, just, it's just some interesting things to note is that at these two different pH levels, we are predicting using the thermodynamic approach that we see you know, differences in the carbonate mineralogy. That's kind of one of the major differences between these fluids is that we have the appearance of, of a sodium carbonate minerals at pH 11, whereas we have pr uh, primarily nacolite, this bicarbonate phase at pH 9. That just reflects the, the, the pH dependent speciation of the carbonates in solution in both of these, at these two pH, pH levels. So now we wanted to address um, the flash freezing, uh, the rapid freezing experimentally. So we did this by dropping a uh, droplet of, of our si uh, synthesized fluid, which we, we, we made up in the lab, into liquid nitrogen. That, that produces a cooling rate of around um, sort of 10 to 60 Kelvin per second, somewhere in that range. Um, these were then mounted on um, SEM stubs as frozen droplets and, and fractured open. And then that actually allows us to, to use um, cryo scanning electron microscopy to actually image the, the cut face. Um, and here's, a, here's an example of a, of a droplet 
imaged under cryo SEM. So this is actually held at, at minus 150 C. And um, what you're seeing here is, is a, a dropper that's been fractured open. So in the upper uh, right hand corner of the image, this white, very reflective material, that's actually the, the surface of the droplet. So it, it's fractured open imperfectly. You imagine it's kind of like an eggshell. Um, and then what you're looking at now is the, is the interior of that, of that droplet. And this technique is, is just really fantastic because it allows us to see um, actual physical partitioning that's going on within the droplet. And as you can see, um, there is structure here in the interior of the droplet. So here's a closer look at that structure. And um, what we're seeing is a, effectively this brine vein network. So even at these really rapid cooling rates of you know, 10 to the two Kelvin per second, um, or 10 to the one to 10 to the two Kelvin per second, we're getting this formation, this templating of, of this brine vein network as solutes are effectively excluded from crystallizing ice. Um, yeah, that's as I showed you. And what we were able to do with, with our setup is um, sublimate away the ice. So, and that reveals the structure of that brine vein network in, in more detail. So in this image, the dark material here is, is, is the ice and the lighter material are these brine veins. Um, you can see here is just partially sublimated. Um, so we've removed some of that ice and, and reveal that structure in more detail. Um, and by looking at the, uh, by, by measuring the kind of um, area and the volume of these brine veins, we were able to estimate that they occupy around 5% of the droplet volume, which means that the, this, the original solutes have been concentrated down into these brine veins around 20 times their original concentration, which is exceeds the saturation points of, of many of the minerals um, predicted to form in this system. So closer look at this, at this brine vein material now, this, this light colored material. So it, it's non-crystalline, it's this kind of glass-like um, material. It has these gas bubbles, these circular features suspended, sort of evenly distributed evenly throughout it. Um, so this is really indicating, this is good evidence that this has, um, has vitrified, has turned it, has, has gone through a glass transition and has formed a, a, an amorphous phase. Now, uh, in order for to vitrify, to, to form glass out of pure water, you need uh, cooling rates of something like 10 to the 6 Kelvin per second, which of course is far more rapid than those we achieved in our experiment. But, um, as you concentrate down uh, this brine into, these, into this freeze concentrated solution between ice crystals, ice grains, then, then um, the, the, the high level of solute can actually uh, make the conditions within these brine veins much, much more favorable for vitrification um, and kinetic inhibition of, of any crystal formation. So what we are seeing here is a two phase product, one that contains um, about 95% likely crystalline water ice and around 5% by volume this really solute rich glass. Um, and this, this is consistent with other studies. This, this is an experimental study um, a couple of years ago, just looking at a sodium chloride solution and they see something very similar. You have these, uh, this freeze concentrated brine, um, which because of its very high viscosity um, actually inhibits crystallization. So you have a, a crystalline ice phase and, a, and a, um, a vitrified glass phase alongside it. And this could be really significant from an astrobiology point of view. Um, glass, aqueous glass like this is, is routinely now used as a means of preserving biological structure in, in perfect detail in order to image it. So this is an, an, an image here of a, of a E. coli cell with um, bacterium, a bacterial cell with viruses, vi uh, bacterial viruses, phages attached to it. And this kind of image taken on a transmission electron microscope really would just never have been possible um, without being able to vitrify, uh, embed this biological structure within a glass. So if indeed we are forming glass at somewhere like Enceladus during a natural process, then um, it's possible that, that uh, biological um, structures within the ocean could end up preserved quite nicely within those, within those particles. Whether or not that's the case, I'll get to in a second. So we also found that um, crystalline salts can form. So um, this happens through a couple of routes. 
Um, primarily, one of the primary routes that, that crystalline salts can form is through warming, rewarming of previously vitrified uh, brine. So now this is an optical microscope um, image. It's actually a video I'm going to play. Uh, what you're looking at here is um, primarily ice, but you can see one of these brine veins through the middle of the image. There's a few bubbles of gas suspended in it that have formed as, the, as it went through a kind of glass transition. And as you rewarm this, what you'll see is um, a yellow crystal mass grow, for, uh, nucleate around here where my cursor is and spread throughout that, that brine vein. So I'm playing it now and um, you can see that crystal mass forming. So this is, this is happening at temperatures far below the melting point of, of the system. So this is a recrystallization, a reordering of that glass uh, upon warming. Um, and if in case you weren't able to see that video, here's just a couple of stills that illustrate the, the, the um, supercooled brine vein with no crystalline salts, and then on the left-hand side, and then as, as it's warmed, it, it forms these, these crystalline salts, which, are, which appear yellow in this image on the right-hand side. So now, um, by using our sublimation technique, we are able to remove all the ice from these crystallized brine veins and actually now look at the kind of salt partitioning, the crystal phase partitioning that's going on within the brine vein. So now we're, we're down on a scale now, which is in the sub brine vein scale. Um, and you're seeing here uh, both pH 11 and pH 9 um, fluids, uh, frozen fluids represented. Uh, and for comparison, um, here at the, in the lower panel are some control experiments where we, we froze the system very, very gradually at around 0 0.01 Kelvin per second. So what you'll notice in the, is in the upper panel on this, on this scale, we have small crystals that are, are, are homogeneously distributed really at this, at this, um, at this 10 micron scale. And, and that's in marked contrast to the, to the um, gradual freezing control experiments where we ha have these repetitive linear structures forming that are very heterogeneous at this, at this 10 micron scale. So to try and explain that, we, we turned back to um, our uh, thermodynamic models that we ran uh, initially. And, um, and com uh, by comparing our analytical results with these models, we can kind of um, understand the provenance of these crystalline materials. So uh, first of all, we have ice forming. Um, actually, alongside that likely is, this, is precipitation of amorphous silica, which forms uh, kind of colloids. Um, and, and these effectively form a kind of suspension within the brine veins. Um, this is a crystal suspension, or uh, sorry, a, a solid um, colloidal suspension within, within the, the brine veins. And as we move uh, to colder temperatures, uh, we precipitate carbonate minerals. These are the next phases to form. And these are identified in, in, in our, um, uh, in our analytically using X-ray spectroscopy to be these, these small crystals um, labeled here. And again, um, due to the textures we observed, we interpreted these to be, be free floating as a slurry in, in the brine veins at this point. And it's not until later in the sequence where we have chlorides forming near the eutectic phase, uh, near the eutectic point, sorry, that, that these kind of push through that crystal slurry and aggregate everything into, into um, the textures we observe. And, and this is, this, these eutectic uh, crystallization textures are also observed in, in in, in metallic systems and also in igneous systems as well. So by contrast, you know, we have um, a very different scenario when we cool very rapidly. We still have the establishment of this brine vein network as I, um, as I showed in the SEM images, but here the cooling rate is, is so rapid that, um, and, the, and the accumulation of high concentrations of solutes uh, that occurs is so, is, is so high that, that we inhibit crystallization within those brine veins. Now, what happens next is, is really a, um, a consequence of, of the subsequent thermal environment that those, those particles then experience. So if, they're, if rapid cooling is sustained, like in our experiments, um, you, we go on to vitrify, uh, we, we um, solidify that brine as a glass and, and end up with this glass bearing ice particle. But if you rewarm this fluid uh, at this point, we can go through this crystallization, which ends up with, um, uh, our homogeneous crystal textures here uh, as things as the, these crystal phases are forming kind of simultaneously and in fixed positions that aren't able to to reorganize spatially um, in sequence so that kind of um, was uh, was uh, how we interpreted these crystal textures 
We also looked at the, um, the mineralogy of the, the bulk mineralogy of our experimental um, ice grains. Um, and this is just an X-ray diffraction plot. What we're seeing here is um, these traces. We have, we have all of our experimental conditions represented. We have uh, pH 11, the upper two traces, pH 9 are the lower two traces, and um, uh, both gradual and flash freezing experiments are, are represented on the plots. Um, remember that uh, we predicted through the thermodynamic approach that um, carbonate minerals should act as, should, should, uh, we should see differences in the carbonate mineralogy. And indeed we do, we see um, that, that this thermonatrite, this sodium carbonate mineral is dominating in the pH 11 regime, whereas we have natalite and, and this trona phase here um, forming in the, in the uh, pH 9 regime. This is an indication that we may be able to, if we can get mineralogical information from, from plume particles and crystalline salts that are, exist there, we may be able to use this as an independent pH probe. Um, but uh, if we actually look closer at the pH 9 regime, we see that nacolite, which again was predicted by the thermodynamic um, modeling, um, whilst it is very clearly present in the gradual freezing experiment, is actually absent in this lower trace from the flash freezing experiment. So this has been kinetically inhibited some, um, through some process and, and does not form. And, and we, we, other experiments that have focused on series relevant fluids and Europa relevant fluids have, have also seen the kinetic inhibition of certain phases during rapid cooling. So there's certainly um, here a strong impetus to kind of understand how uh, mineral precipitation kinetics um, are are uh, defining these kind of solid phase assemblages. Now remember that um, these flash frozen uh, particles have actually been initially vitrified and then recrystallized upon warming. And still we lack the, um, we lack the nacolite here that we would expect if it had just cooled gradually. So to summarize um, kind of this, this initial section, um, we have these two possible end member products. We have glass bearing ice particles and ice templated salt minerals. Both, in both instances, we expect crystalline ice, um, but in, in one case we have a freeze concentrated amorphous glass, which is very solute rich, and in the other case we have minerals. Um, in, in the example of minerals, these will form either through kind of a simultaneous crystallization occurring upon rewarming of previously vitrified uh, brine, or they can, they can form in sequence during a kind of more gradual or more um, uh, sort of standard cooling sequence that we might expect and be able to predict through thermodynamics. Now e each of these two competing routes to form crystalline salts um, can, re can uh, leave a textural and a compositional record of their, of their formation, um, which is something that could be used to kind of probe um, cooling rate conditions within, within, in the future within, within uh, cryovolcanic systems. So the question really is which one is more likely do we, are we expecting that we should see glass at Enceladus or crystalline salts? Um, and now this really depends on the thermal environment that the droplets experience as they are uh, accelerated up through the vents towards space. Um, of course, our experiments here are, are kind of showing that, that non-destructive measurements of, of the plume particles that could get at, for example, mineralogy might be able to actually help us infer some of these dynamics indirectly. Um, but we can also comment on it uh, we can also comment on it um, just with, with current knowledge. So um, this is a kind of uh, very kind of back of the envelope calculations presented on the right hand side of, of potential conditions uh, that our experiments have experienced and also within the vents. Um, so I'll just walk you through it. We have fluid volume or droplet particle radius on the x-axis and uh, cooling rate on the y-axis. You can see our experiments here are labeled. Um, they're much larger than the particles uh, counted by Cassini, but they still experience cooling rates that, average cooling rates, I should say, that, that, that we can compare with potential um, conditions at Enceladus. Now, based on um, some work by uh, Mik Miki Nakajima and Ingersoll in 2016, we have some um, constraints on what we think the pressure temper con temperature conditions within Enceladus's vents might be. And, and based on that, and um, uh, either the, uh, the role of conductive cooling as droplets are transiting upwards towards space and experiencing a temperature gradient, or evaporative cooling um, as uh, droplets are experiencing rapid um, 
changes in pressure, uh, we can kind of um, predict a range of cooling rates that they might experience. So the blue box down here labeled B is the conductive cooling rate we might ex expect if these droplets are simply losing, losing heat only by condu conduction to the surrounding environment as they're transiting up, the, up through the cracks. So you can see that's, that's not particularly rapid um, compared to our flash freezing experiment. On the other hand, the evaporative cooling, even at the kind of lower bounds, the minimum expected, which takes into account the kind of minimum change in pressure between the, the liquid interface and the, and the immediate environment above it within the vents, that um, these evaporative cooling can achieve extremely rapid cooling rates that exceed um, those in our experiment that, that led to this uh, glass formation uh, within our droplets. Now, they're still not rapid enough to achieve what's thought to be the vitrification of pure water, the glass formation of a kind of bulk solution, bulk dilute or pure water solution. So we can kind of expect that we probably still have some crystalline ice forming um, and rejection of solutes into kind of super cooled, um, it, uh, rejection of solutes into kind of a super cooled um, brine. But of course, um, the thing is about uh, evaporative cooling is that uh, the vapor pressure of, of one of these droplets will decrease extremely rapidly as it cools. So this is effectively a, a self-limiting process and it will never, as like our experiments where rapid cooling was sustained all the way down to liquid nitrogen temperatures, here evaporative cooling will probably cease around about the time when, when the water crystallizes. So what happens next to that supercooled brine that has formed? That really depends on, on then the thermal environment those droplets experience. So uh, more work is definitely needed to understand the kind of conditions that these might experience. But I would say as a kind of to wrap up this section is that um, based on the fact that we have droplets or particles that in the plumes that form likely through condensation, some condensation of vapor is likely onto these frozen um, salt rich droplets. And that will import some heat and likely rewarm them slightly, even if they really, even if they cool really, really rapidly initially through evaporative cooling. Um, it's likely that uh, that they will rewarm slightly as they transit up the vents. Now, just based on current knowledge, then that would mean I would kind of feel that the most likely result here is crystalline salts in the plumes that may have experienced some kind of kinetic supercooling, um, and therefore not reflect the kind of equilibrium assemblages. Um, but uh, so this sort of pathway uh, that I described earlier, simultaneous crystallization pathway. But as I said, that's very much kind of um, back of the envelope calculations and more work is needed there to, to, to understand that. So, um, okay, I'm just going to talk now quickly about um, how this ties into kind of an astrobiological angle. So, um, one of the next kind of exciting questions I think that is, is kind of interesting to, 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 to pin down is if there is microbial biomass within Enceladus's ocean um, and it's being captured by these frozen droplets, um, how does that partition within them? You know, what phases does a microbial, do, would, would microbial biomass associate with during this rapid cooling? And that is potentially very important for um, its detection using space-based mass spectrometers uh, it could define how these how microbial biomass might fragment um, as it enters these detectors, but also, you know, understanding how it partitions and whether we might expect very well preserved microbes could help um, kind of give some justification for future efforts to go back and, and sample these plumes or other plumes um, at other IC bodies um, in the future. So this is the focus of ongoing work right now. Um, and I'm going back to the cryo ICM in, in next month to, to, to work on this. And we'll hopefully be able to see some, see the results of microbial cells being partitioned during flash freezing. But I can rely on some previous work that I led in 2018, where we looked at a, a very simple brine system, just a very a silica rich system. This was published in EPSL in 2018. And we effectively um, did a very similar experiment, but we included microbes. A uh, few different pure strains of microbes in some natural communities, and you can see on the right-hand side here, this is a, a, a silica lattice, an amorphous silica lattice precipitated out within um, uh, brine veins of of, a, of an ice, uh, an ice between the ice crust, ice crystals that have precipitated. It's a very similar process, but we're just looking at a simple brine containing silica. 
And what we found is that um, uh, in most of the cases of our biological biomass, these cells were preferentially excluded from both the ice and from the, from the silica, and they accumulate here at the, at the edge, the surface of this, this silica particle. So the silica here has been removed from ice, in this case, just by melting the ice and, and drying it. Um, and we can see these, these cells have been sandwiched between the kind of advancing ice face and, and the precipitating amorphous opal mass. But that is not the whole story. Some strains, for example, this chloroflexus filamentous bacterium, was actually never observed on the surface of particles and actually was always encased within um, particles. So that's implying here that this is co-precipitating with or perhaps nucleating the precipitation of this, um, this opaline uh, silica. Uh, and that's corroborated by some spectroscopy we did showing how um, uh, pigmented microbes on the surface were very, very easily observed with Raman, whereas these, uh, these chloroflexes also pigmented were, were, were not observed by Raman, despite the fact that, you know, this, this is a, uh, sorry, this is the surface technique. So it's really only probing the surface of these particles. Um, so so uh, we had Raman spectra that look very similar to the, to the blank, the experimental blank that had no biomass in it. So this just shows that, you know, with a simple two component system of ice and silica, how um, the story is quite complex. We might have different types of organic compounds uh, interacting with precipitating inorganic phases in different ways um, and potentially associated with, with some of these different phases in, in, in different ways. So um, definitely moving into these more complex brines now with, with future experiments. Okay. So that's, that's the end of this first part. As I mentioned, I was probably going to spend a bit more time on that. And um, in the interest of time, what I'm going to do now is, is give a kind of brief summary. I'm going to change tack and talk a bit about some field work I've done, some field analog work. Um, but I, I won't spend too long on that because I want to make sure we have time for questions. So hopefully wrapping up before um, uh, 12.50. Um, so this second part, um, we are looking now at, at, at uh, some potential natural analogs for material on, on the surface of, of Jupiter's moon Europa. Um, so this is work that was conducted primarily with, um, collab in collaboration with, with University of Western Ontario with Gordon Ozinski um, and a few other collaborators, some of which are listed here. There's quite a lot of people been involved in this work. Um, so here's some kind of credits for, for them. I'll try and my best to do that as we go through. And, and there's a lot of ongoing stuff that's come out of, of working on these really unique systems, which I'm going to describe um, now. So this work was motivated really by a desire to, to find somewhere on Earth that we could use as a, as a natural analog for, for Europa. Now, that's a challenge because, of course, we have very, very different systems you know we have an icy an icy body an airless atmosphere lacks an atmosphere um has a, a high radiation conditions very very low temperatures and of course here we have a thick atmosphere and we have liquid water on the surface and we have a, a very active biosphere so it's a very challenging to find good analogs for for processes at an ocean world like europa um here on earth but we we found one that i think is kind of compelling at least from a chemical point of view now um, this is Axel Heiberg Island. It's in the Canadian High Arctic. Um, you can see on the map where it is. Um, it's in the Nunavut region. And um, why Axel Heiberg? Well, this is a, a, um, a kind of fairly low resolution uh, stratigraphic um, uh, representation of the, of the area that Axel Heiberg sits in. You can see Axel Heiberg here is this uh, red box. Um, and I don't really, I don't, you don't need to, to worry about any of the, the geology here other than the fact that these, these red blobs, these are carboniferous evaporites. Um, these are remnants of an ancient ocean. There's layers of salt, gypsum and halite and anhydrite um, that were laid down around 250 million years ago. Now, these are popping up all over the place on Axel Heiberg as diapirs through neutral, through relative buoyancy. And when you see them, they're really obvious. So that's, um, you can see a really clear exposed evaporite diapir in the background there. This is actually, I think, outside of Iran, it's the, it's the largest concentration of exposed evaporite diapirs anywhere in the world. Uh, and the difference between here and Iran is that in Axel Heiberg, we have 400 to 600 meters of, of permafrost as well. 
and it's this interaction between the permafrost and the, the evaporites that that forms that feeds this formation of these really unique cold saline springs. So that's what you're looking at here. It's um it's a spring that emerges from this single vent. You can see me inside the vent. I'm actually sampling the brine that's emerging from the subsurface here, and that's Oz flying the drone. All of this white material is salt. It's not snow or ice. Um, the fluid is coming up. It's anoxic. It's highly saline. We're looking at around 28 percent. Um, dominated by sodium and chloride and, and sulfate as well, lots of sulfate. Um, the, the temperature of these springs is stable all year round uh, against a really um, you know, extreme fluctuations in air temperature, which is this uh, the jagged trace here. You can see that, that, that some of these spring temperatures here are, are absolutely rock solid stable all year round and often sub-zero. So Lost Hammer Spring, the one you see in the background here, is, is, is around minus five degrees C all year round, does not freeze due to the, the high concentrations of salts. And as I mentioned, this is a salt deposit. Um, it's fr primarily formed of, of these polyhydrated sulfates and, and some chlorides. These are phases that, that really don't form these like, kind of large scale deposits like this in many places on earth. Um, they, they're common in sea ice and in other ices, uh, but having a, a, an exposed salt deposit like this is quite unique. Of these hydrated phases because often in briny environments we're looking at deserts we're looking at warm environments where you have um, uh, salts that form that, that, that are not so hydrated and, and some of these phases have been um, invoked as potential candidates to to explain the composition of, of non-ice material on, on Jupiter's moon Europa so that's why that's kind of what got our attention about these springs we, we noticed that the existence of these sodium and magnesium sulfates um, uh, in the spectra from Europa, and, and, and that's why we decided to go and, and, and ex examine, explore these, these spring systems. So in the interest of time, I think I'm just going to skip over this. We did some work looking at the, the potential origin of the spring brines using hydrogen and oxygen isotopes. I'd be happy to talk about that later. Uh, we visited three springs, you can see on the map. Um, Lost Hammer Spring, which is another shot of the same spring in the background here. and um, uh, Stoltz spring on, on the eastern side as well. I'll just show a quick picture of that. It's on a completely different scale. Here we're looking at a sort of kilometer sized deposit that fills an entire ravine and um, uh, you can see you can get a sense of scale by, by there's, a, there's a, one of our field team here stood on the deposit uh, and this is slightly different. This is a very chloride rich again hydrated salts but it, it really is kind of a, a glacier sized uh, salt deposit here that's forming. So what we did is we um, exposed samples of these salt deposits to Europa surface conditions of temperature and, and measured near infrared spectra, near, near infrared reflectance spectra. And that's what you're seeing here is the three springs we visited. I haven't mentioned Color Peak simply because it's uh, dominated by gypsum and calcite and is less relevant to, to Europa. What we did is we, in this, in this right-hand plot, we, we resampled the spectra, processed the data to kind of match the spectral resolution of some uh, upcoming and historical spacecraft instruments. And when you do that, you, you'll notice that these salts from Lost Hammer, which are these bottom two, um, re reproduce the, the data from Europa, from Galileo, which is this black trace at the bottom. They reproduce the, the, the geometry of these main water absorption bands really, really nicely in terms of their, their width and their band minimum positions from the Galileo data. Um, so this is kind of a compelling spectral analog for this non-ice material on the surface of Europa. So how does it form? Well, um, we, uh, we, we, used, we, we took samples of this and we did some X-ray diffraction work. And, and this is what you're seeing in the right hand side. These are plots of the minerals that form in these, that, that make up the deposits in these springs. It's less important to worry about the specific minerals here and more just to see that these are qualitatively different mineral assemblages. Um, the three springs have very different chemistries, sorry, very different mineral uh, deposits forming. Uh, draw your attention to, to Lost Hammer here, which um, uh, has, uh, despite the fact that it is, um, I should say the deposit here, the, these peach colored and red these two, the major bars here, the, the, the dominant minerals in this system are sulfate minerals, mirabolite and thenodite. Thenodite is simply just the anhydrous form of mirabolite, may well have dehydrated during transit and sampling. Um, 
this is a sulfate dominated salt deposit but that's despite the fact that the brine itself is actually chloride rich you know by a couple of orders of magnitude chloride dominates over sulfate so this is, this is a chloride dominated brine forming a sulfate dominated salt deposit so again, we did a, we did a bit of um, uh, thermodynamic modeling to try and understand how this deposit forms. This is the same program I used in the, in the first part of the talk, freeze chem. Um, here you just see uh, the system solidifying under, under three different conditions. We have evaporation occurring under both summer Arctic temperatures and winter Arctic temperatures and freezing um, on the, in the lower panel. And the first thing to notice is that um, the summer uh, evaporation forms a lot of gypsum and we don't see any gypsum in this deposit. So, so that kind of rules out um, the, the, the warmer evaporative mechanism to form this deposit. This is a cold temperature deposit. It's forming under, under winter conditions. And, and moreover, what we are seeing is a snapshot of the early evolution of this fluid, whilst mirabolite, this black trace here, um, in both the, the evaporation and the freezing case, uh, uh, this is this is the dominant phase here. So we're we're looking at an early snapshot of the evolution here before we start precipitating lots and lots of chloride, which is um, what what we predict would form towards the end of, of freezing or evaporation. So th this is a, this is not a, um, a a complete representation of the brine. And of course, this is very important if we think that you know on a, on a moon like Europa, we will we will be only looking at um, uh, these salt deposits. So to understand, we need to understand the potential for um, a, a deposit like this to become fractionated away from its its main um, from its original source brine. Okay, um, I think I'm just going to uh, just cover this very briefly. So now, having kind of established the um, uh, the formation history of these deposits and and their usefulness as spectral analogs for for Europa, we've been doing a bit of um, uh, kind of astrobiology work looking at the um, the sulfur biogeochemistry in particular within the springs and, and this is Arola Moreras uh, who was a PhD student at St Andrews when she did this work she's now a postdoc there um, she's produced these amazing these, these beautiful records of quadruple sulfur isotopes um, looking at samples from the salt deposit here and actually showing that um, uh, these these really enormous fractionations um, between um, the sulfate in the brine and 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 the sediment and sulfides that have accumulated in the sediment. Uh, this is a really indicative of biological activity. So these deposits are recording um, sulfate reduction, biological sulfate reduction that is going on in the subsurface and then is now being recorded in this surface deposit. But also by using these minor isotopes as well, um, we can actually start to. Uh, pick apart some of the some of the sulfur cycling metabolisms like sulf sulfur um, oxidation, uh, sulfide oxidation, and and uh, sulfur disproportionation. So these are microbial metabolisms that cycle sulfur. And by using this quad sulfur isotope approach, we can actually start picking apart this um, in this surface record of of subsurface processes. And now we're building that into to, um, to using spacecraft relevant instrumentation. Uh, in this case, pyrolysis, ramped pyrolysis, uh, mass spectrometry uh, of the sort that may one day fly on the on the Europa lander spacecraft um, to try and recover uh, some of these sulfur isotope signatures using kind of mission relevant um, techniques. That's ongoing work at the moment. Doing uh, working with with Amy McAdam and NASA Goddard and and their team. Okay, so. Summarize that second part. Um, so I've shown you some salts on Axel Heiberg that, that are really low temperature phases that provide spectral analogs for Europa's non-icy material. Um, the, uh, if we have endogenous sulfate salts on Europa, um, they may not rule out a chloride dominated ocean. They may form from uh, a very, very chlorinated domin chloride dominated fluid, which, which um, has deposited a sulfate rich deposit initially. And, um, uh, kind of using a, an approach of integrating the experimental work I showed. Um, I hope I've given you a sense of how the kind of modeling and experimental work and the modeling and the field work is used in parallel here. And I think this kind of three-way conversation is going to be really useful for supporting both interpreting existing data and, and supporting upcoming missions. So really now, as I mentioned at the very beginning, is what we need to understand is, is, the, is the extent to which surface materials on moons like Jupiter's moon Europa and, and Enceladus actually represent that ocean below. 
So I'm going to stop now and I'll take any questions. Thanks. Thanks so much, Mark. That was a really great talk. I know it can be a little bit difficult uh, to get an understanding of the uh, audience reaction in these uh, virtual settings. So if you if you enjoyed the talk, please uh, be sure to, uh, and, and to say that in the chat. Um, we have a few comments and uh, and questions as we uh, yep. and going forward um, that, that showed up early. Uh, so uh, Dan Roy says, I'm puzzled that uh, H2 and uh, H plus are not mentioned. Uh, is, is that not like candy for microorganisms? Yeah, yeah, so and that's a really good point. Uh, in particular, at Enceladus, you know, we, we have um, molecular hydrogen in the plumes. And this is actually one of the really strong lines of evidence that the ocean is in contact with rock and is currently experiencing um, uh, hydrothermal um, water rock interaction kind of like serpentinization on, on Earth, which, which produces hydrogen as a byproduct. So, so we think that there is quite a lot of hydrogen in the ocean at Enceladus today, and that could well be um, uh, an energy source for microorganisms. And there's some really interesting work, you know, kind of recently being done um, by Christine Ray at Southwest Research Institute, who, who's been looking, kind of trying to quantify the, the amount of energy available for microbial metabolisms and the resulting biomass we might expect. So I'd point you in that direction for that. Um, I haven't mentioned it because we, we do, uh, our fluids in the freezing experiments were just in equilibrium with nitrogen gas. So I, I mentioned gas bubbles, that's just nitrogen. Of course, it would be really interesting to start thinking about whether flash freezing like this could actually capture snapshots of the oceanic gas inventory within the particles. Um, and if, they, if so, then it would also capture that hydrogen. So that's, that's something I haven't done, but it's, it would be really interesting to, to explore. Uh, Robert Baltos has a question. I read that it would be difficult to sustain the current level of Enceladus plume activity for a long period of time, and that the current regime is relatively recent, uh, about 500 million years. What impact would that have on the development of life? So, uh, great point. Um, I think the, the jury is kind of still out. I mean, I'm not the best person to actually ask about the history of the Saturn system itself. Um, but I think that, the, as you say, there's, there, there is some reason to think that, that Enceladus may not have been doing what it's doing now for the entire history of the solar system. Um, I think to answer your question about the impact on the development of life, um, we just don't know enough about the, the origins and, and uh, development of life to actually be able to answer that. Um, one thing I would say, though, is that regardless of whether Enceladus has been active hydrothermally and habitable for 4 billion years or 500 million years, it's still, um, in terms of astrobiology, a really important place, I think, to study. If it's particularly young, it actually might give us a window into, into really early stages of, of prebiotic chemistry that are lost to us on Earth because of the, 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 that part of Earth history is really just sort of being erased by tectonics and, and um, other processes. So I think either way, even if it's old or, or young, it's still, you know, astrobiologically very, very important. Alma asks, how does the pH change at greater depths, for example, in the rock, rock water interactive zone? Yeah, that's another great question. Um, I think, again, the jury is pretty out on that. There, there is some, there is some um, reason to expect that the, the ocean is quite well mixed, at least in the, um, uh, in the, in the region beneath the, the tiger stripes, which are these, these cracks that source the plumes. Uh, and the reason for that is, well, there's several reasons. We, we see a lot of ex uh, um, products of hydrothermal chemistry, which, which suggests that we have a kind of hydrothermal plume in the ocean there. Um, but also, uh, uh, there's a couple of papers that, that, that identify colloidal silica associated with the plumes. Um, this is why I included, I mentioned colloidal silica in my slides. Uh, it's actually thought to exist in, in, in the ocean. It forms, as a, again, as a result of hydrothermal activity. But if there was a long residence time of this silica in the ocean, if it was kind of hanging around for a long time, it would, it would nucleate and form much larger particles. So the, the size of these particles that Cassini encountered suggests that a rapid transit time between the, the sea floor and space, effectively. Um, so um, 
uh, that, 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 that suggests, I'm, that's kind of a tangent from your question, but that, that suggests that it's quite well mixed, which means that the pH that we are seeing um, in the plume, the pH that we're inferring from plume data, which is effectively the source region of the plumes, might, might be representative of the whole water column, at least at that part of Enceladus. I hope that helps to answer. While we're waiting for uh, there's some more questions in the chat, uh, I just wanted uh, to note that uh, if you if you are interested in the in brines and the interaction between uh, the between brines and the geology of and out, out throughout the solar system, uh, the LPI has begun our uh, the the first of our uh, seminar series or uh, conference series on uh, brines across the solar system. Uh, the Modern Brines Conference is coming this uh, October 25th to 28th, so I do highly encourage you to sign up for that. Um, that will be uh, a virtual conference uh, looking at the geology, uh, integration of the geology, geochemistry, and astrobiology aspects of uh, currently extant brines across the solar system. So I highly encourage you to, uh, to look into that if you're, if you've, if you're interested in the, this talk. Uh, I have posted the link to the uh, that initiative uh, page in the chat, and you can also find that by searching for uh, LPI uh, brines across the solar system. Uh, hey, thanks, Sean. I intend to be there. Excellent. Looking forward to it. Uh, Jay Bird asks, uh, "What about iron deposits on Europa from Io falling into the cracks? Any opinion?" Yeah, um, I, I, I'm not sure. I haven't I haven't heard much about the prospects for iron, um, iogenic iron. This is, this is material that's sourced from Io, um, Jupiter's moon Io, uh, that may end up on Europa. If, if that is the case and iron is, is also making its way there, that's pretty interesting. I'd not heard about that. Um, I'd have to look into that. Certainly sulfur, sulfur from Io does end up on Europa and, and this actually could be a major contributor. It is a major contributor to the composition of, of Europa's surface. And the question really is, you know, to what extent is that material um, uh, recycled down into the ocean? Um, what, to what extent are the sulfates that we see on Europa um, purely from Io? Are some of them um, endogenous? Are some, some of them Europa, uh, native Europa sulfates? Are some of them, uh, or are all they all from Io? So that, these are kind of ongoing questions. Uh, it certainly seems that the youngest regions of Europa's surface are quite sulfate poor, especially the ones that are away from the kind of peak of Io's sulfur bombardment. Um, but yeah, iron is not something I, um, iron Fe, I know my accent sounds like I'm saying the same word all the time, but iron Fe metal, um, that is something I've not heard about. So I'd be interested to, to, to find out a bit more about that. If you have any papers or anything to point me to. Fantastic. I've seen a lot of uh, uh, compliments in the in, in the chat, which is great and great. Um, I, I, this, was, this was a really great talk. I really I really appreciate you uh, taking time in, in for this. Yeah, my pleasure. No, it's it's good. I, I really enjoyed talking about this stuff. And to be honest, I, I often have, I, sometimes I present, you know, the, the field analog stuff as one talk or the experiment as one talk. So maybe it was a little bit much to try and cram it in, <laughs> both in, but I, I felt like there would be folks here who would be interested in both aspects. So, um. Absolutely. Well, it's one o'clock, so, so uh, thank you so much for coming, everyone. Um, the LPI virtual seminar next week, the guest will be uh, Mark Panning of uh, JPL, who will be talking about uh, planetary seismology. Um, so please join us here for that at our usual time of 3 p.m. Central. Uh, thank you again, Mark, uh, and uh, thanks everyone for coming. Yeah, thanks, Sean, for inviting me, and thanks, everybody. Have a great day.